basically a math methods course. It was, you know, how many different ways can you solve a boundary value problem with a beach ball with every other wedge at a different voltage and what's the electric field inside, that kind of thing. So some years back, it was decided that since we already have math methods, that's the place that you learn about special functions and, and um, boundary value problems and so forth. And, uh, and this semester, one semester course, thus, will have a fairly accelerated uh, review of electro and magnetostatics. And then we'll spend the vast majority of the time talking about electromagnetic waves and radiation, and hopefully special relativity as well. Okay. Um, so uh, it's a good idea for you if you haven't studied for your prelims in the internet, which I hope I'm sure everyone has uh, passed them. Um, then. It's a good idea to make sure you review your undergraduate uh, course uh, in the m because I'm really going to be assuming that stuff right there at your fingertips. Um, let's see. Uh, what else can I say? Well, you know, the textbook, just because it looks nice on your shelf, uh, is um, the famous J.D. Jackson book. Um, now in its third edition. I actually had Jackson uh, as a professor at Berkeley. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I didn't have him for E&M. I had him for quantum mechanics, and it was. And then I also had at the same time I had, you know, the E&M course. So it was like all Jackson all the time. And I used to have a lot more hair. So, uh, I'll show you a picture sometime. Um, Anyway, we won't be following the book in any sort of uh, very systematic way. Um, I have, as many of you know, my own idiosyncratic ways, and so you're forced to sit through them. Um, and, uh, but nonetheless, I mean, there's a tremendous amount of excellent resource here, and so this is the book. Uh, there are in, a few other books are, are mentioned as possible uh, references and um, you know, collect them at your desire. Uh, as far as the grading goes, uh, there will be, the grades are going to be assigned based on combinations of problem sets and exams um, and when, no. Um, so uh, we have we'll have problem sets pretty much every week, and you know this is boot camp for physicists. So start practicing walking through the tires and doing the monkey bars. Just what's going on here? Um, those of you in the military, I'm sorry, you probably think it's part of boot camp. I'm sure it is. Uh, beyond that. Um, there will be two take-home exams uh, sort of sprinkled into the semester, and, and then there will be a final. All right? Um, let's see. So, you know, what's written here is what's called a tentative syllabus. We'll see how far we get. Hopefully we'll get through it all. Um, and uh, I have a kind of schedule, you know, like you have fantasy football, I have fantasy syllabus and fantasy lecture schedule. Let's see how we we'll do. All right. All right. Um, does anybody have uh, any general questions, concerns? I don't mind us emailing you with problems that we have with problems, correct? I don't mind you emailing me, but um, I don't guarantee instant res uh, responses um, relative to, uh, you know, 
issue, you know, some questions, specific questions about, I'm not sure how to do this problem, so forth. We'll do our best to answer those. Um, we do have office hours, TA will have office hours, uh, and uh, we have a problem session. Um, and if I am available, I'll do my very best. So yes, feel free to email me, but uh, um, I don't promise instant response. Uh, I'm on Facebook, but forget it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, anybody else have, have other, other questions? You say this is, our, the textbook is going to be, it's not kind of a regimented that's right. So I will in the in the, in in when I assign an assignment, I'll reference um, relevant sections of Jackson uh, that are uh, coordinating with what's going on. Mm -hmm. But in addition, um, I will be distributing my notes, so they'll be kind of the main text. But for those of you who've been in my course, you know, can talk to them what that's like. As far as lecture goes, uh, uh -huh. lectures come from a section of the book? Or no. No? But will it be corresponding sections? Yes. Some, sometimes yes, sometimes no. Sometimes. If there was a book that did exactly what I wanted to do, well, I would, I would write it. That's the problem. <laughs> yes. So presumably the question on the homework would not be from the book? Sometimes it will be. I mean, as in? Will you reference I will. I will assign a, a problem from Jackson right. from time to time. Yes. So it's not that this is completely disjointed. Uh, what we're covering, what's in the text. I mean, E and M is pretty standard stuff. Uh, there's really kind of that's why you know it's, there's the book. Um, but you know there's plays on the theme, and you know. So mine will be in D minor. <laughs> Anybody else have questions, concerns? So we should pay more attention to your notes than to Jackson. Yeah, I mean, you question? know, the way my, my, you should pay attention to the homework. Um, and, you know, the way I look at it, when I want to learn a new subject, what I do is I try to get a few different books simultaneously. Because if I just read one book, I'm kind of just getting a reflection of exactly what that one individual interpreted and thought about. And in order to really learn a subject, you need to make it your own. You need to hear your own voice understanding it rather than the voice of Jackson. Um, and so, what the way for me personally when I learn is I have to, uh, I, I eventually just take this Venn diagram of all the different approaches and then I see what's kind of intersecting within them and then I kind of understand that this is really important. So my point of view on this is that you should do both. You should read Jackson, you should pay attention to lecture, should, notes will be re-emphasis of lecture and through the combination of those Something will, will emerge that will be your understanding of the, of the coursework. Do you also post your notes online? Yeah, yeah, they are. So that's the point. So, you know, right now, if you look at this, it says download one. So that's already available. Um, and so they'll be available online. And they'll, they'll generally be scanned, handwritten notes. Uh, this first one happens to be typed. Because, you know, at one point, and I have just a tiny bit more hair. I, I did was ambitious, and I, and I did uh, type them up. But you know, I'm old now. Um, maybe someday. Um, I don't generally. I mean, as you will learn, um, all of my many idiosyncrasies. Uh, generally, the notes won't be available before class because it's my view that. Uh, you learn better by taking your own notes and paying attention than reading. And if I, I if if I just give out the notes, people tend to not be, you know, if you want to read them, that's fine, and not come to class, that's your prerogative. You know, uh, attendance is not mandatory. 
But if you're coming, I just prefer people, you know, engaging with me than reading the notes. All right? Very good. All right, so we're going to take the show on the road. Um, everybody should shut their cell phone off. Mine's off. Good. Um, and uh, that's it. So, subject of, of, of electricity and magnetism, you know, to me, it's really the most beautiful subject we have in physics. And it, it's really a, a representation of the best of the scientific method. I, I myself, my research uh, is in um, quantum physics, and we all, you know, quantum physics is cool. Quantum physics is ugly. Uh, you know, it's, it's all this hand waving and all this, you know, kind of uh, magic of sorts that seems to come out. And, and the electricity and magnetism is, in some sense, the most pure of, of physics theories that we have. It's the basis of modern field theory. It's what Einstein was hoping to build on uh, for uh, his version of, of a unified theory um, back at the 100 years ago or so. Um, and, uh, you know, when I, to me, what I mean by this is that um, when, when we think about the scientific method and physics, we have some interplay between experiment, or what you might call empirical data, um, and models, what we might call theory, and the history of e &M shows the interesting feedback between these, in which, you know, if you think back historically to the uh, 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th century, people, you know, shocking frogs' legs and sticking those stones and coils and, and kind of getting a sense of that, of electric and magnetic phenomena and the connections between them, um, which led, of course, Faraday uh, and Ampere and others to develop mathematical models in which to describe uh, the data, the, the um, how am I writing? Um, yeah. Uh, Next uh, 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 ICAL. Thank you. Um, so, one of the important aspects of this in the scientific method is, of course, we also have within our thinking about our models, um, we think about. Uh, consistency. And as well as um, thinking about conjectures based on physical principle. So, of course, we know historically in this development, once we had some of these models, Maxwell um, looked carefully at these mathematical models and realized that there were inconsistency in that mathematics. In particular, the question uh, of conservation of charge was inconsistently modeled according to the um, laws of Ampere and Gauss, uh, 
etc. And from that was able to um, deduce purely from theoretical perspective that the equations need to be modified in some way in order to account for that inconsistency. And from that developed the idea that uh, the electromagnetic wave was related, or was one and the same thing as the optics. That's quite amazing. I mean, that's quite a triumph uh, for physics. And of course, that in itself isn't the whole story. It's when that is fed back and one can do the experiment. It hurts the experiment to show that uh, radiation was formed, radio waves were formed from oscillating currents, and that is the triumph there. Um, of course, we have other examples of that. An important example is the, the issue of the notion of the speed of light, which In this case, the empirical data was the Michelson Morley experiment, which was gave the null result that uh, there was any difference in the speed of light in different inertial reference frames. And of course, that led Einstein to conjecture that, well, maybe the speed of light is the same in all reference frames. And if that's the case, what are the implications? So all of these pieces together gives us such a, a theory based on as pure logic as you can possibly get. And it's for that reason I'm always really excited. I haven't taught this course in many years. And I love it for that reason. Um, Okay, now there is one, you know, when I said how beautiful this is and how excited I am about it, um, there is one thing that's particularly ugly, and that's the question of units. So when we, uh, Electricity and magnetism, we start, we start from the, the basics of the empirical aspect of electricity and magnetism. We're talking about the, the, the basic observation is that there are forces on and due to charges and currents. That's the foundation. So we have Coulomb's law. Coulomb's law um, tells us that if we have two charges with some distance between them, and I can define a coordinate system with some origin, which is some potentially other place. So the position of charge 1 we'll call x1, position of charge 2 we'll call x2, r21 is then x2 minus x1. Um, then the force on charge 2 due to charge 1 is proportional to the product of the charges, the distance between the two charges squared, and the direction of the force on 2 due to 1 is in the direction, the unit vector, between them. OK, that's, of course, Coulomb's law. Um, now, we have the issue of units here. And so I said it's proportional to all these things, and there's some constant 
call K1, that in some sense relates the units of distance and charge to the units of force. Okay? Um, similarly, we have, we said forces and charges. This is Coulomb's law. This from a magnetostatic point of view. Now, I don't know, Carlos, how this is going to work. This is going to be. Oh, we'll try. Should I come a little closer? I, it's fine. All right, we'll try. So we have the VO sub R law, which, um, you know, I'm thinking, I don't know, guys. So should we, given the size of this class and um, the angles of things, because uh, no one's going to see this, right? You guys over there, like over there. Now, if I, if I write in the central board, is this doable? Okay, so we're going to skip these two boards, and I will go back three times. Uh, all right. Vino Sabah. All right, so the Vino Sabah law um, tells us about the forces uh, between currents that are today. So if I imagine some long wire and some current flowing in it, and some other wire and some current, and I, I'm just drawing some little chunk of that current, um, and there's some distance here. So this is wire one, this is wire two. Again, we have the vector connecting them. Um, we have a little current here I'll call DI1, or let's see here, keep my notation straight here. Yeah, that's the way I want to do it, right? So there's a current I1, there's a little unit vector, or not unit vector, differential vector of length DL1. And there's some current here, I2, DL2. Then the force on this little chunk of the wire, DF, due to the little chunk one. Well, unfortunately, it's a magnetic field, so we got cross products galore. So we have I DL1. Uh, oh, this is force on two. Yeah. So it's proportional to these two little elements. We have force on two due to one, which is I one D L one cross R two one hat over R two one squared. That's correct. And again, this is proportionality. And that proportionality uh, constant we'll call K2. Right. <clears throat> we'll come back to what choices we should make for those constants uh, in a moment. Um, so, of course, we can treat and think about electro and magnetostatics um, we can do so just in the context of thinking about action at a distance and forces. Um, and that's perfectly fine, and we can get everything right that way. But uh, it is very fruitful, as you know, and becomes extremely important in the context of dynamics to abstract and think about the notion of the field. Um, so, well, what we do is we say, well, if this is charge 2, the reason that charge 2 is experiencing some force due to charge 1 out here is that charge 1 produces some local electric field. So this is the electric field due to charge one at the position 
of charge 2. And the, the definition of the field, as you know, is the force per unit charge. If we think about a little test charge here, you experience what its force is, we divide by that charge, and we get the field. So the force on charge 2 is proportional to that charge, and the electric field at position of charge 2, in this case, the electric field due to charge 1. Of course, we are ignoring, in this case, the self field. That's a whole other law of what acts of what the, the, the fact that this charge itself produces a field, and how the heck do we deal with that? Maybe we'll come back to that at the end of the semester. Um, so from this, this if, if we take our force law as given over there, uh, this defines the unit of the electric field as well with respect to the same constant K. So the electric field due to charge 1 at position charge 2 is then equal to that same constant proportional to charge 1 um, R21 squared R2 hat. Um, of course, the unit vector is equal to the vector divided by its length. So sometimes we will write this as the vector R21 divided by the magnitude cubed because one of those absolute values gets absorbed in to give us the unit vector. And that is sometimes written out more explicitly in terms of x2 minus x1 divided by the magnitude of the vector cubed. k1, excuse me. Okay. Similarly, we have the notion of uh, the magnetic field. Um, so the little differential force on this current Um, in this case, uh, depends on what the local electric field is due to one. I'm sorry, the magnetic field, pardon me. And that magnetic field here is related to this cross product, right? So we have this, this uh, vector going in this direction. The cross product tells us then that the local magnetic field is out of the board. This is the magnetic field due to a little d, d1, due to one of these guys over here. And then the, there, therefore, is a force, uh, which is, in this case, attractive. Right? So there's a force df on 2 due to 1. So this gives us a definition again. So we have the, the little differential force due to 2 on 1, I dl 2 cross into the magnetic field due to 1 at the position of that little chunk of wire. And from this, we have a definition of the magnetic field based on the B.O. sub R law. Now, we have yet another constant to choose because we don't, we have current, which is charge per unit time. We have distance. We have electric field. There's no necessary reason what the choice of the units of magnetic field don't have to be tied to the same definition of force, and so the most general thing we would do, sort of an extra constant we have, is to define dd, in this case, to put a constant here, a new proportionality constant.
And so from this, what we see is that the magnetic field depends on this ratio of whatever constant we chose for this constant K2, this new proportionality constant, which is called alpha, and then all this stuff. Okay. Oh, I should mention one last thing before we then get into what our choice of these constants is. Of course, in the picture that I drew over here, um, the force, if I imagine this to be an infinite wire, uh, the force on these becomes infinite. We integrate over the whole wire. So typically when one thinks about this problem with very long wires, what one does is one looks at the force per unit length. Okay? So if I, wanted, if I integrate this over all distance, I get the local magnetic field, which is finite. But then the local magnetic field exerts a force per unit length, which is, depends on the distance between the two wires. And that force per unit length is equal to K2 times 2, the total current I1, I2, divided by the distance. Okay, so now we need to, the question is, for the question of units, the question is, oh, I shouldn't have come into this board. I have to, this is going to be a challenge for me to work into this because you put people in the corner there. Sorry. Uh, the question of units is, what is, what do we choose for K1, K2, and alpha? Once we choose these three things, we fix the choice of units. Okay, so. Uh, let's, let's try it. Yes, sir. Um, so this is like jumping the gun a lot, a lot, a lot. Um, but does the weight need to worry at this point about, because there's going to be, like, won't there eventually be some relationship between those to get, like, the speed of light or something? Right, we're not going to mention that. They are, they're not um, unrelated quantities. So we'll get to that very in just a moment. Okay, okay. Um, in fact, let's, let's say something about that right now. Let's just look just from dimensional analysis of ask what is the unit, not in terms of the number, but in terms of length, distance, etc., the ratio of K1 to K2 assuming these are both forces. So the force is the uh, units of mass times acceleration. So that's fixed. Um, we have Coulomb's law over here, which depends on distance squared, depends on k and, and the two charges. Whereas this thing depends on k2, the two currents, and the two distances. These two things are, co are common in both of these expressions. We have this and this common. So the ratio of K1 to K2 must be related to the ratio of the charge to the currents times the distances, right? So whatever the number is that we choose for these two things, the ratio of these two things must be of the unit of some velocity squared. Then K1 and K2 both convert currents and charges to forces. Is that clear? And in fact, as Jacob mentioned, this number is nothing more than the speed of light squared. Now, that is amazing. That's just from purely magneto and electrostatics. We haven't even said anything about radiation. But it's built in. It's baked already in there. Um, 
So C is the speed of light. So whatever units we choose for K1 and K2, their ratio must be such that K1 over K2 is 1 over the speed of light squared. Okay? All right, so now in uh, the ancient days of the 19th century, there were two standard choices for these units. Okay? First of all, in the ancient days, already we got into the metric system. But the metric units that were the uh, uh, um, standard were, instead of thinking about uh, what the uh, SI units, which came a little bit later, CGS stands for centimeter gram second. So first of all, these are the uh, standard units of the CGS system. Um, and so there were two sets of units. First of all, in the, the, the arcane system is to choose alpha equals one, period. Okay? So if alpha is one, then uh, we have two choices. One is called the ESU system, and the other is the EMU system. Electrostatic unit, uh, electromagnetic unit. The ESU chooses K1 to be 1, in which case K2 has to be uh, equal to um, C squared. Right? So in this set, this is a particular choice of units. One of the things that you notice about this unit is that if you choose this set of units, firstly, that the unit of charge is related to length, time, and mass. They're related because if you look at Coulomb's law, let's come back to the EMU. If you look at Coulomb's law, then Coulomb's law says that force is equal to charge squared over distance squared. Right? And since force is equal to mass times acceleration, and this is charge squared over length squared, then charge uh, is related to these other things, right? Charge, then the unit of charge is equal to the square root of the unit of mass, the unit uh, of length cubed over time squared. Okay. This unit of length is called the electrostatic unit. I mean, unit of charge is the electrostatic unit. And then the unit of current is 1 ESU per second. Okay. Um, all righty. So that's one set of units. We never use these. But I want to go through this because I want to see where the hell these units come from. Right? It's not something that just... You know, Moses came down, it wasn't the 11th commandment, there shall be epsilon not. Uh, uh, that, there was a reason. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, um, oh, by the way, um, the unit in CGS units, the unit of energy, or the unit of force, is a dime, and the unit of energy is an erg. Erg! Um, now, of course, these are just other CGS units, right? I, I mean, other uh, metric units, because it's just a question of whether you're using meters versus centimeters. So there's just factors of 10 that convert these guys. Uh, an erg, I remember, is 10 to the minus 70 joules, and a dime is 10 to the minus 5 newtons. Okay. Um, the EMU 
is just the opposite. You choose K2 to be 1, in which case K1 uh, has to be 1 over C squared. Okay? And in this case, this defines the unit, instead of charge, defines the absolute unit, a new unit, which is, uh, or the, the unit that relates charge to length, time, and distance as what's called the ad amp, the absolute amp here. So the ad amp is the uh, one ad amp must have real chalk. Let's see what we got. Excuse me. So the ab amp is defined such that if I look at the force per unit distance, which we said in this case with k2 is equal to 1, the force per unit distance then is twice i1 i2 over the distance squared. If I have one ab amp in each two wires, with one ab amp each in the wire, then if I have one dime per, is, is the force such that the force per unit, sorry, is the current such that the force per unit distance is one dime per centimeter when the distance is equal to one centimeter and the current is one half amp. Okay, so, oops, sorry. Beware, he says. All right. So it's defined in terms of this is the the defining relation between force and current. If I put one ab amp of current in each wire, I separate those wires by one centimeter. If I get one dime per centimeter, that's the that's the standard of current. And then a uh, you know an ab coulomb is one ab amp in a second. So why is it called the sorry? Why is it called ad? Yeah, it's absolute. It was absolute, was yeah. Because this was ab in terms of these sense of absolute units. The reason was, so now we're, now we're here we are in industrial England, where the telegraph is being developed, you know. And the ad amp was a little bit too much current for uh, standard practices. And so this, they defined, I mean, these names of ad amp came later and so forth. One amp, or an ampere, is one-tenth of an ad amp. Okay? That's just because it was, that wasn't very practical. This was the practical unit for telegraphs in the 19th century. That's why we're stuck with the amp. Because that's, you know, the wires in telegraphs, the ohm was defined because of whatever wire they had. It was not from some fundamental physics of any kind. Really, one amp is pretty big. It is. It's not, it wasn't, it's not practical anymore. This is practical for telegraphs. Yeah. It's a big current. It's true. Yeah. Yeah. Telegraphs I also use like a lot lower voltage, so it's not. But this is not, I mean, so we're, we're kind of coming to a point which is that, I mean, is this really, there are standards, I mean, ultimately as physicists, as we know, if you're analyzing a problem, what you really want to do is think about what are the characteristic units of the problem you're working on and make the problem dimensionless and tie the units to the problem at hand rather than some piece of metal sitting in France. But um, on the other hand, you know, we ultimately need to reference to some, so these things have historical background basis. Okay, so this is, these are, this is the, these are the um, sort of most 
the, the least in some sense contrived set of units. You just set alpha equals to one. There is this constraint between k1 and k2. So you choose one of them to be one, and then the other one is c squared, or one over c squared. Okay. Now, there's one problem with this set of units and why none of these are used anymore. And because alpha equals one, the unit of the electric field and the unit of the magnetic field are different, right? Because the unit of the electric field and the magnetic field are related by this. If alpha is one, this is not a charge. This is a charge times a velocity, right? So in, in, in EMU and ESU systems, electric field and magnetic fields have different units. And that stinks. Um, I want to come back here and just read you a passage from Jackson. So, favorite story. Um, chapter 11, special relativity. <laughs> Beginning with chapter 11, we employ Gaussian units instead of SI units for electromagnetic quantities. Explicit factors of C appear in a natural manner in these units, making them more appropriate than SI units for relativistic phenomena. So why the heck did you use SI units for the first half of this book? We're not going to do that. Um, because SI units aren't the appropriate physical units, they're really appropriate more for electrical engineering. And somehow, and this is the editor review. The fact that halfway through the book, you have to switch units tells me something. So we're going to stick with what are called Gaussian mixed units throughout. And you are going to have to learn to speak two languages in this at the same time. Um, so, um, all right. So we're going to, we'll come back to this. There's this, so we had ESU union, we have yet a third set, which are called Gaussian mixed uh, CGS. The fact that it's CGS and not, you know, kilograms and, and meters is not so important. The important point is that in Gaussian units, Gauss obviously what is behind this, um, the electric field and the magnetic field have the same units. As they should, because they are just different visions of one another in different reference frames. Um, in order to do that, what we choose, alpha has to have the units of one over a velocity so that you can cancel out the distance and the one over time that occurs in the relation of force to charges. So alpha is one over C. And so that's why it's called mixed, is that it kind of mixes uh, the um, EMU and ESU kind of system. In this system, we choose K1 equals 1, just like in the ESU system. So Coulomb's law appears as Q1, Q2 over R21 squared, R21 hat. That's it in these units. Um, the force law here now because alpha is 1 over C, the Biot-Savart law, so this is Coulomb, the Biot-Savart law, and I can, I guess I must go up here, huh? Okay. 
we will get used to these things over time. Um, okay. Now, of course, there is yet a um, fourth set of units, the one that is the standard, really, SI. NKSA. Now, uh, this is sometimes called rationalized, although I find it quite irrational. NKS units. And in this set of units, you choose K1 to be the very intuitive 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. And K2 is mu naught over 4 pi. Of course, K1 over K2 is equal to 1 over mu naught times epsilon naught, which, as we all know, is 1 over the speed of light squared, as it must be. Um, why is this called rationalized? There are also, there's actually a fifth set of units, which is rationalized Gaussian units, sometimes called Lorentz heavy side units, which is what, if you read, for example, Sakurai's relativistic quantum mechanics book, that's the units he uses. And the rationalization here is the dividing by 4 pi. And that's so that you get rid of 4 pi's that show up in Maxwell's equations. We'll come to that in a moment. But I like those four pi's in Maxwell's <laughs> equations. They tell me something about geometry. Why would I want to get rid of them? Because um, you know you're lazy? You don't want to write four pi? Come on. Um, that's why that's done. That's why it's divided by four pi. Uh, yeah. So SI is arcane? Well, our SI is what, if this is well, some astronaut, international, uh, it's, it's not arcane, it's uh, it, um, in the sense that arcane means it's like not used anymore. Well, alpha's one. Um, yeah, that part is the same, but. So we don't call it an arcane? I don't know. Okay. No one calls it. I just meant those are old units that no one used to. Oh, I see. These two sets of units are used. Uh, I mean, Jackson uses both of these in his book. Um, now, what is epsilon naught and what is mu naught, and how are they defined? Well, here's how they're defined. And now, actually, at least they have been. I think the system of units, you know, what used to be called the Bureau of Standards is now called National Institute of Standards of Technology. They're redoing all these things, kind of tying them to more fundamental quantities. But this traditional definition of the amp is the same definition. So the idea is that if I have, if I um, put one, that, so, so why is this got called MKSA? Because now we have a new unit, the amp. Okay, that's a new thing. And that these proportionality constants relate force to current through mu naught. Okay? And the way it's defined is that the force per unit distance between two wires um, with one amp each separated by, or I should say the force, yeah, unit distance separated by one meter equals 10 to the minus 7 newtons per meter. Where the heck did this 10 to the minus 7 come from? 
Well, it came from this, because this was the natural definition when this was 1 to ab amp, and this, uh, this shouldn't be squared, pardon me. I erase that from your notes. Uh, this was uh, not, it should be equal to 2, 2, 2, 2, 2 times that, right? Because it's 2, 2 times 2. This is equal to 2 dynes per centimeter. The 2 dynes per centimeter is this amount. Okay? So, um, with that, we then define mu naught is equal to 4 pi times 10 to the minus 7 newton times newtons per amp squared. That's the definition of mu naught. Um, so mu naught is not a new unit. The other thing that's defined is the speed of light is defined as 2.98 blah 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 10 to the minus 8 meters per second. Sweet, that's 68. Oh, yeah, that would be really bad. Here, right? <laughs> <laughs> Um, and then, of course, epsilon naught is defined uh, through this as epsilon naught is equal to um, c squared over mu naught. Okay. All right. So we have different sets of units. The set of units we will use fairly exclusively in this course are the Gaussian Units. One of the reasons that I like this is one of the tools we have in doing at least theoretical physics is dimensional analysis. Kind of look at the problem, are the units right? Who the heck knows what the units of mu naught and epsilon naught are? You know, can you curve? Convert Farad meters to grams? I mean, I don't. Uh, what are the units of magnetic moment? Magnetic dipole moment, you can tell me. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> God, I know. The units of, well, in, in CDS units, they're the same units as electric dipole moment. What's the unit of electric dipole moment? Well, it's charge times distance. And so that's the same thing. So I can check. Oh, yeah, I left out a C. Um, so let's look at, let's write down Maxwell's equations. In Gaussian. So we have Gauss's law, Gauss. I used to love the old Deutschmark, you know, used to, I think it was the Deutschmark uh, before the Euro, they used to have a one, one of the bills had Gauss in one of their, you know, I don't know, 20 Deutschmarks or something, and it had the Gaussian on it, it had the dichromalization, <laughs> you know, it was great. You pull it out, if you're like, pretty much, I'm just got my money, sorry. <laughs> um, all right, Gauss's law. Gauss's law. Del dot E is equal to 4 pi rho. 4 pi is right, because 4 pi is all about the solid, the 4 pi stir radians. <clears throat> we want to get rid of that. So the 4 pi's that will come in as a result of this are from what, spherical? Exactly. So you're integrating over a sphere. There are 4 pi stir radians. I mean, this is really 4 pi times k1, right? And k1 is 1. If it was 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught, then you would have rho over epsilon naught. You got rid of that 4 pi. Um, the lonely equation, because it has no name. <laughs> Um, we have uh, 
carry del cross B e is equal to minus 1 over C. Now, let me, let's just take a look at this and just think about the, the dimensional analysis of this. Um, one thing, I can look at this right away and know that I got my C in the right place. Why? Well, in Gaussian units, the electric field and the magnetic field have the same units. The gradient is a derivative. It's 1 over a length. And so C times T is a 1 over length. Cool, did that right. Similarly, del cross B, 1 over C, D, 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 T, I got the right thing. Also, if del cross B is rho, well, this is a, a derivative of a field is, is a charge density, then I got my C right here because a current density is a charge density times a velocity. So this is like rho times V. And so if I divide by C, yeah, I got all my C's right. This is a um, Let's just for fun write it, well, uh, fine, put this as in SI units. Del dot E rho over epsilon naught. Del dot E is still zero, that's good. Del cross E is minus d d d t and del cross b is equal to u naught j plus one over u naught epsilon naught d d t. Which one do you like better? Probably this one is you know. <laughs> Um, now, for if you want a you know a little bit of a shorthand, you can a little bit of a trick for conversions between SI and CDS when it comes to uh, statics is for electrostatics since K is one in uh, K one is one in Gaussian units and 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught in SI units is to make the substitution epsilon naught goes to 1 over 4 pi. And for magnetostatics, mu naught over 4 pi. So this is discussed uh, in some detail um, in uh, the uh, appendix of Jackson. It's a good fraction of it. Uh, and um, I might just take a look at this. I think it's important to speak a number of different languages. And you will see, you know, when it comes to uh, Physics textbooks, as well as research that's done in this area, it's kind of all over the map. And so really you need to be bilingual at least. You can forget about Coptic, arcane languages like EMEs. All right. So I think we'll call it quiz for today, unless anyone has any other questions. Um, oh, I guess there's one last one. Homework will generally be due on Fridays, okay? So what I will do is Fridays, uh, 
the homework will appear on the web. I'll send an email, let you know it's available, and then it will be due in the Grainer's mailbox, MJ, in his mailbox by uh, 5 o'clock. Okay? Actually, I'll probably say 2 o'clock because I don't want you guys to go closely. Uh, yeah. I'm going to put you on the spot. Okay. I think it would be cool to see those equations with the k's in there and the alphas. Could you? Uh, right. Well, they don't appear, the alphas don't appear here. Huh? The alphas appear actually in one place. The alphas appear in the force law. I mean, so I guess I should write that down. The force law in. The relationship, I mean, you remember Maxwell's equations relate the charges to the fields. But the Lorentz force law tells you what the force is then on charges and moving charges. In SI units, the force is equal to um, QB cross B. Again, note here. You see explicitly, if I have electric and magnetic fields that are, are in the same length, it's only when the charges are moving close to the speed of light that magnetic forces are of equal strength or of comparable strength to electric forces. It's another sort of intuition. We know, generally speaking, magnetic forces are tiny compared to electric forces. It's explicit here. Um, so now the question, Brad, is what, what is this? So, uh, this would be 4 pi k1 for O over here. Um, and uh, this would all be multiplied by k2. And this would be multiplied uh, by Faraday law, it's a good question how the heck that would come in. Alpha, I think this is equal to minus alpha, the relationship between E and B. So in, in SI, I mean in CGS units, alpha is 1 over C, K is 1, K2 is then equal to mu naught uh, over 4 pi, yeah. That's all. That all works in this case. So these, and then the max, and then the other uh, relationship here. Yeah, I think this would be. There would be um, Q E plus B cross alpha B. So that's the most general form. And you would put in something for an alpha k1 and k2, and you get those equations. All right. Have a good afternoon, everybody. Um, uh, I'll send you all an email. Is everyone registered for the class?